Hello and welcome West Island School parents. I'm Claire Howarth, Vice Principal of Pre-16 and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar led by my colleague Ian Benji, Head of the Maths Faculty, who's going to talk to you about the best learning experiences for your child in maths with a particular focus on Year 7 and NYP, but parents of other year groups who have joined us um, very, very welcome to listen, and I'm sure that you'll pick up some excellent advice and guidance from Ian. Before Ian starts, I just want to uh, remind you, if you have any questions, very welcome to use the question and answer function at the bottom of uh, the screen there. And if you do have questions, if you can just hold off towards the end, and then Ian will uh, do his best to answer what he can before we finish. If you have any specific questions regarding your child's progress, then please leave those questions and uh, direct them to your child's math teacher. Ian, I'm going to hand over to you and I'll see you at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Claire, and uh, thank you to all the parents out there. Thank you for coming along and um, spending this time to uh, listen to me talk about math education, something which uh, um, is very important to me. Um, and I'm going to have a good time here trying to explain a few things to you. And if you do have questions, just please put them in that chat uh, box at the bottom. So I was talking to my year 12 class just the other day about maths education, because of course, mathematics is a discipline which is um, uh, something separate to the human sciences, but mathematics education is definitely human sciences and how, how we learn and how we behave when we learn things. And we talked about scope. What is the scope of learning mathematics? And I tried to write a sentence or a paragraph, I should say, with my year 12s about that in theory of knowledge to explain what we hope to achieve in, in educating children in terms of maths at West Island School. What should it mean? And that's the statement I came out with to better understand the kind of behaviours, interactions and tasks that create the best learning experience for children and young people. And then, of course, by using the word best, I had to explain that to them. And I said, well, best in terms of, of evaluating the cognitive, cognitive development of children, their conceptual understanding of mathematics, promoting their self-esteem. So teaching mathematics in a way that um, promotes self-esteem and then developing an appreciation that the learning process works. That's something that I find unusual sometimes that some people don't believe that the learning process works, that if we work at something and practice hard and put our efforts into it, that we can get smarter, we can get cleverer, we can get better at things. So to instill in students that working hard on their studies does work and prioritizing the future, not necessarily the immediate. So immediate results are sometimes useful, but we're looking at building students mathematical understanding. So they're great math students when they're 17 and 18 years old not just when they're 11 and 12. So that's the kind of scope of what we hope to achieve in education in maths at West Island. Um, it's quite a big thing, mathematics and being literate in number. Uh, why is it important? It's not just about passing examinations. There's a number of different studies which go into how mathematical literacy can help you in the workplace. And this was one very recently from the middle of October. Um, again, a human science study of education, but the study linked uh, mathematical literacy with people's understanding of fake news, particularly here for COVID-19. So if you have good mathematical literacy, you are less likely to be fooled by fake news. And so we, we know it's not just about learning numbers and algebra. We know there's a bigger, bigger thing going on here. And mathematical literacy in the workplace and in um, society is a very important thing for students. So I want to start with that, but let's go on to um, what it means for education in something like year seven. And probably the most common question I'm asked by year seven parents is, uh, is learning timetables times tables important? Well, yes, the answer is yes, it is important, but there's a but. So yes, it's important, but if you just learn times tables, um, let's think about the six times table. If we learn the six times table, as a bunch of facts, something that like six times seven is 42, and we learn this as a bunch of facts. Well, that's not really helping you in terms of your mathematical literacy and your mathematical understanding. 
So if a student says to me they know their six times table, a question I might ask them straight away is, okay, what's 42 divided by six? Because some students, when they learn their times tables, don't always appreciate the link between multiplication and division. So if you're learning times tables or you, you know that your son or daughter is not yet fully secure on times tables, um, one thing you can do is you can start off by stating something like six times seven is 42. And then I'm asking for three further statements which connect the numbers six, seven, and 42 to build this understanding of how numbers work. So three statements which are equivalent would be something like that. And see, it's making sure that students understand this connection between times tables. Another question you might ask if you think you know the six times table is, okay, well, what's the difference between four sixes and nine sixes? What's the difference between four sixes and nine sixes? If a student worked out four sixes, four sixes are 24 and nine sixes are 54, 54, and then they said, okay, well, 54 subtract 24 is 30. Well, that's a, a long way around if we think about it, because if we are very secure on our six times table in terms of what it actually means numerically, well, nine sixes and four sixes have a difference of five sixes. And so you should be able to go straight to that difference. And so the agility and that confidence with number is a really, really important thing for young um, people when they're first of all learning mathematics and so some students can be very 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 strong with their times tables in terms of learning facts but do they really have that solid understanding of how these numbers connect in terms of the mathematical operations and the numbers so it's just an example there of how we can question students to really find out if they do fully understand the concepts of times tables but yes in short times tables are very very important I should have maybe taken it back a certain step and explained that you'd hope at a fundamental level that students who have learned that four sixes are 24 know and understand that that means um, six plus six plus six plus six. So there's obviously a link there with the addition as well. So again, just that understanding of times tables is hugely important. And later on, I'll kind of talk to you about how that agility and the confidence with number and times tables helps in lots of other related tasks um, that we'll do in year seven. So that's a very common question, as I say, as I'm first asked in mathematics. I should explain also that this um, thing I'm using here is Kami. This is very commonly used now in all maths class classrooms. We started using it extensively during, um, during the COVID closures, uh, but it's something we've continued to use. And I'll explain why later, because students keep links to all notes made in class, which is very, very useful. So that's a start point for us, times tables. Another activity we do when students first arrive at West Island School is this activity, which we call 1089. 1089. So what we do is we ask students to pick a three digit number uh, where the first leading digit, the hundreds digit, is bigger than the units digit. So something like 743. We ask them to reverse this and subtract. And of course, straight away, we're checking whether students have a really good understanding of columns. Uh, values of digits within columns and can they complete this subtraction so three take away seven we can't do that so we have to borrow from our tens so we're checking on you know students do they know these methods but of course more than that um so 13 take away seven is six three take away four and the tens or 30 take away 40 we may kind of check whether students realize that's 30 take away 40 uh, that's nine tens and then six take away three is three. So we get to that point there. Uh, we then reverse this. So six, nine, three, and now we add uh, and we get nine, nine and nine, 18 and three, six, nine. We, we also, sorry, <laughs> we also three and six and nine and, and the one carrot is 10. And we have that result of 1089 or 1089. Um, this is a great way of checking the, the, num the numerical confidence of students in terms of column subtraction, column addition. 
but we can also just allow students to do a bit of a level of level of investigation something we like to do in mathematics is we like to investigate things so students can then see well let's see what happens if we just try a different example we can subtract seven take away nine we can't do all oh, but this is a bit more difficult so when we give one like this we have to borrow in a different way so how confident are students doing this and uh, we get to a position here where we get 198 we reverse again and add and we end up with the same result 1089 so we can quickly check um, because they should always get the same result and the next question of course is for students who are very confident with this while we're going around classes and just dealing with any small questions we have. And this is how we can also deal with mixed ability because some students may not be so confident with column addition and subtraction. We can instruct them on those methods and explain why these methods work. And as we're doing that, some students who are very confident will be trying to explain why this works, why this works. And so a couple of different ways they could go about doing it. If we take another example, um, they could try and explain that in this case we're always always going to have to borrow from the tens which leaves a situation where we're going to get um, seven take away eight in this case we're going to have to borrow again and we're going to end up with this situation where this digit is going to be one less and you're borrowing from the tens so this will always be a nine in that central digit that will always end up as a nine and students can start writing sentences explaining why this is the case because in mathematics we do like sentences um, even the, well, the very very highest level of mathematical proof at universities includes a lot of sentence writing and explanation and argument and so students can write sentences explaining why this is the case um, other students will be able to talk about the result here when if we did two take or the difference between six and two is four and how the answer here will always be six um, because six take away two is four, but we end up with a six, which is the complement of 10. And we teach them words like complement. So lots and lots of words we use in technical language and mathematics again. And some other students who may be comfortable with algebra, some students who um, may have looked at algebra in some maybe math tutorials or at another time, they may be more confident to think about what would happen if we call these uh, digits a b and c and reverse them to c b and a and then what happens in this case well we know that c has to be less than a so we can't do this without borrowing and so we'd have b minus one here and this would be c plus 10 and so this term under here would be c plus 10 take away a and there are students who are confident confident to um write this kind of algebraic manipulation. Um, here we have b minus 1 plus 10 take away b, which actually is 9 and explains in algebra why that's always 9. And we do have year 7s who are able to do this level of algebra. Not many, if I'm honest, most are, if they've seen algebra before, um, haven't used algebra in this expressive way. They've been taught algebraic rules like A plus A is two A. So they're not really sure how to use it in expressive ways. So this is a big challenge for them. And, but as they get old, older and they go through the school and we train them to use algebra in, in, in an expressive way, it's a very common for us to use algebra and algebraic thinking to explain generalizations. So they can talk about, um, generalizations using sentences, diagrams, arrows, explaining what they mean, or they can, in year seven and year eight, we try to get them to start using expressive algebra, but this would be certainly our highest end of thinking in year seven. But just an example of how a task that started the same, just simply take a three digit number with the leading digit being bigger than the last, that can be a very solid educational experience for someone who is really insecure in column addition and subtraction and someone who is incredibly secure and challenging them to use expressive algebra to express, explain and carry on from here to explain why you always get the answer 1089. So these kind of tasks are called um, low threshold, high ceiling tasks. These tasks are tasks that have a low threshold. Everyone can start them. 
everyone can have a go, but the the top limit of of these tasks is often unlimited because uh, you can take it in def different directions and certainly people who enjoy their mathematics and are very, very capable at mathematics can still get something out of these tasks. Here's an example from statistics. Um, we can all um, work out, I mean, a calculator or a spreadsheet will tell you how to work out the mean of a number, you add them up and divide by how many. Uh, and that's a pretty straightforward thing to do. Add them up and divide by how many. Um, so we could give students lists and lists of numbers and get them to add them up and divide by how many, but that's not really going to improve their mathematical literacy and understand what an average is, uh, the different averages that we use in terms of mean, median, mode, how they relate to one another, what a data set with a high mean or a high mode or a low mean, that will not help them in any way at all. So how do we improve their mathematical literacy? Here's a great task. We're going to ask students to create a set of five numbers which has those properties. And straight away, you've got to be thinking, well, uh, it's a bit of problem solving. Where do you start? Um, so some students will think, okay, I've got five numbers. So I've got five spots, five spaces. I've got to fill up. And the median is the middle space. And that's got to be three. So there's a good start. The mode, the most common number has to be a three as well. So we'll plonk another three in there. Okay. And then I've got to try and get a mean of four. But if we tell them that we add them all up and divide by how many, that gives us the mean. We know that the mean of four with five numbers, the sum, the sum of the numbers has to be 20. So we kind of, everyone again can start this task. Some people know what the mean is and we'll work out that the sum has to be 20. Other students will have to talk to them about that relationship between um, the mean and the sum. And once you work out that the sum has to be 20, you can then play around and find out all different answers to this. You could have a one there, I think a five and an eight works. If you add those up, you get, what do you get? Fourteen. Yeah, that's sum of 20, so add them up, divide by five, you get a mean of four. The median's three, the mode is three, and there's an answer. But we want to be more creative with mathematics and mathematics thinking at West Island. As I say, we want to address students who may not be confident adding and dividing in this way, but allow able students to run off with this and say well okay you've got to find all the different sets so there's not sometimes one answer in mathematics there's many answers and this question here can you explain how you know you found them all again justifying the set of solutions of five numbers with these properties it's not an easy thing to do but students do a great job in writing sentences and explaining when they get their big long list we do a lot of group work on tasks like this and then we collate all the results and we ask those questions. Do you think we've got them all? Uh, another extension task for something like this would be this situation, which is not straightforward at first sight. So again, mean, median, mode, range has to all be the same number and a single digit number. And a lot of students immediately say, oh, well, that's easy because it's just five threes. The mean is three, the mode is three, the median is three. But of course they forget there that that range is not three, that range is zero. So that wouldn't work. And, um, you know, we, 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 we try to give them that sense of excitement and, and um, yeah, they want to try and find the answers and that sense of achievement when they do find the answers. And when they think they've got an answer and they get it wrong, we want them thirsty, thirsty to try and find an answer that works. And so um, if you're wondering, I, I can't see anybody, but if you're wondering, there's an answer there. Okay, that set that data set has a median of two, a mode of two, a range of two. And if you add them up and divide by five, you'll also get two. And multiples of that data set would also work. But what's interesting there is, is there's more answers than just the multiples of that data set of five. So again, a very interesting question for anyone, any adult that's interested in maths, that is actually quite an interesting question. And then how can you be sure you've got all of your answers? Um, Looking at something like algebra, because that's another question. Uh, when do we start algebra? And again, uh, we start algebra when we need algebra is a good answer. If I teach lots of students that A plus A is 2A and 7A minus 5A is 2A, well, it doesn't really mean very much if they're not really using it. So we start algebra when we, when we need it. And we've been doing it in year seven recently. And this is a recent assessment that we used for MYP1. And students had to investigate squares. 
like this, which were two by two squares. And the sum, the sum of the top left number plus the bottom right number. What's the, how are we gonna work that out? And so one way of looking at this is we can use algebra because on this 100 square, sorry, that's dreadful, isn't it? Apologies, you get the idea. There we are. So in any square on this 100 square, if we call this number N, what will this number be? Well, the one directly below is 10 bigger. The one directly to the right is one bigger, but in the diagonal, that one there is 11 bigger. So if you add these two up, these diagonal sums up, you'll see that that sum is 2n plus 11. Um, interestingly, if we add the other diagonals up, well, that one there is n plus one, and that one there is n plus 10. So the sum of the other diagonals is also 2n plus 11. So students were led into this. We gave them number examples they had to fill in. They had to fill a table of results in. Um, the other way of doing it is actually is to tabulate the results and then see a link between the top left number and the sum. So we can do a link like this. So the top left number, so the top left number is 12, the sum is uh, 35. If the top left number is one, the sum is 13. If the top left number is three, the sum is 17. And the students had to try and work out what went in here. And if you look and spot that it's actually times two plus 11 so different ways different ways of creating the same result maybe with a formula from a function machine here or a formula from expressive algebra for generalizing there and we teach students all of these um, ways to kind of try and communicate their mathematics and this was a a um, assessment in myp1 which was to do with communicating mathematics which is one of the strands, one of the four strands of assessment and pattern spotting. And hopefully you can see how this task is all about pattern spotting and communicating your mathematics in sentences, diagrams and algebra. Um, uh, mathematics classes, we have every class will have a Google Classroom. So um, very commonly, this is my year seven Google Classroom at the moment. So if your child is in my class, this is their Google Classroom. Um, you can see that this is how we'd set something out. The Kami I'm using right now, it, we link, I link it onto the Google Classroom. So there's worksheets here, there's instructions of what to do. This is just for today's lesson. Um, and the students get the Kami link. And if you click the Kami link, what's great about that is everything we did in the class today is saved and students are able to see in live time exactly what what we did in the lesson, look back on it, see me writing all over the worksheet they were, they were working on. And this is what we did today in my year seven, which was looking at areas of triangles. So um, yeah, quite a number hadn't seen the formula base times height divided by two in year seven. Uh, so we talked again about language, I mentioned language earlier on, perpendicular, a very important word in mathematics. So every time we do that, we spend a long time talking about language in mathematics. Um, but you can see this is a worksheet we did today where students had to make up triangles of their own and then find the area. Some are much easier to find than others, um, depending on if they've got an easy vertical height to find. So this was some work from today and the students can, tonight, that can just click on that cami and remind themselves of the work we did during the lesson. So it's a live document that updates as I do it and they've got those links to them. So this is a very common way of working in math and classrooms across West Island School now since I think the COVID shutdowns. So that's a kind of hopefully an insight of the kind of tasks we do in maths and the reasons why we do them. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And I, I think I'm just going to invite Claire back now. Hello. Thank you so much. And um, do you know, I, it's it's great just to uh, listen to how you're approaching um, the learning of maths in your classrooms. And um, I hope parents that it gave you some insight into how we engage other people with maths. And it really does go beyond just as Ian said, you know, just one formulaic approach. It's about context. It's about developing the language. 
It's about multiple approaches um, to solving a range of problems. And as Ian said at the start, really giving um, young people um, a sense that they can achieve it if they work hard, if they persevere, if they're resilient, and there's a sense of um, being able to make lots of mistakes in the classroom and learn from them. So thanks Ian for that, that was really useful. Um, and in terms of questions from parents, if anyone has got any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box now. One um, parent did raise in just as you were talking that they were keen to have um, the resources and links so that their children can practice maths. You may just want to chat to parents um, about the resources that are available. I know the Google Classrooms are very rich now with lots of additional resources. Uh, yes. Anything else to share with parents? Yeah, and whenever I do these these kind of things, um, the, everything I've shown you there is things I've done with a class of mine and is on the Year 7 NYP1 curriculum. So those resources will be in the Google Classrooms of your Year 7 children. So, um, yeah, that was, again, the last thing I showed you. That is exactly what I taught period two today. Um, so it's very much a live experience. Um, but yeah, the Google Classrooms are the place to look. The other thing I should say, should I, can I share my screen again? Yes, please do. I, um, I should say is we try to do also in year seven, because I know that some parents are keen um, when, when students are very, very keen on mathematics. Um, they are keen for extension and, and ideas for extension. So if you go to the Google Classroom for mathematics, you'll see down the right hand side is a kind of whole list of things and there's an extension and extra work so for every unit or for units I try and put some extra work in so if we're doing area and perimeter at the moment in our work and there's a there's a whole bunch of you know really quite challenging questions but the beauty of these resources they're not written by me they're written by very clever people who uh, challenge students in their thinking without necessarily needing lots and lots of content so in the extension questions there, you'll see that students don't need to know high level algebra. Um, they can actually be very, very challenged just knowing what the area and perimeter definitions of a 2D shape are. But the questions are very clever, very well cra crafted and still very challenging. And, and as again, as an adult, if you're interested in um, mathematics, have a look at some of those problems and you'll see how how clever they are in, in questioning. So there's a whole world of very clever maths questions out there that challenge without necessarily needing new content input. It's more of your thinking and, the, and challenging your mathematical understanding of the concepts. Um, yeah, at, at, at an age appropriate level, I suppose. Um, and we have no more questions regarding um, math learning, Ian. So. Um, I hopefully that means that parents have got the insight that they want from this evening's presentation and um, no more questions we will sign off thank you Ian for leading us through and giving us that insight again thank you parents for joining us on this Tuesday evening and if there's any further questions um, please don't hesitate to contact um, the maths faculty yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. Um, obviously, I love maths education. So thank you for giving your time on a busy, during a busy week to uh, listen to me talk about maths. Thanks, <laughs> Ian.